Okay, um, so uh, we're all here for Edge, of Com uh, Edge Computing at the Edge of the World by Skulk Kinnis. Uh, Skulk works at a large telco um, and is the founder of House for Hack. Uh, and his talk is all about what he likes to do on the weekend. Oh, video. Uh, video, are we good to go? Awesome. Good to go. And uh, what do you like to do on, the, on your weekends? Take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the title of the talk is Computing of the Edge of the World. So I was telling my friend this is my title. And he said, okay, so now are you one of those flat earth people, right? So like, where exactly is the edge of the world? <laughs> so now I said, well, okay, so let's assume the earth is round. And you've got these pointy bits. So those would be the edges, right? So, so I, I like to go to these mountains. And... Um, I've got this little glider that I built, and we do this at Housefax. So we build these little gliders. It's basically a piece of corex, and if you fold it the right way, it becomes a plane. There's some glue and a lot of duct tape in it. And then you've got the remote control, and you can see the only control surfaces that I've got are those two there, so there's no motor on it. Um, okay, so that's the, the intro. Um, thanks, that's pretty much. Okay, so what is Housefax? Housefac is a makerspace. We've been running for eight years now. Uh, long, longest running makerspace in South Africa. We do 3D printers, we build these flying things, lots of electronics, lots of Arduino stuff. Um, and then recently getting into CircuitPython and doing um, also a little bit more machine learning. Okay, now back to my plane, and this is what I like to do on weekends. Okay, so that's me. There's the plane flying. This isn't Wackerström. Wackerström is sort of close to Volksrest, between Volksrest and Petritief. And the idea is that you've got the wind sort of coming up the slope, and it generates a lot of lift. Sometimes there's thermals. The thermals also create lift. Um, I've got a little diagram that's going to come up any second now, so I need to just time. Okay, so there's the diagram, so you get it. So you get the wind kind of hitting the slope, up its direction, and you kind of fly in that area there. And uh, sometimes we fly like really fast, and you try to fly yourself off the cliff. And if you go with my friend Philip, he always flies you off the cliff. <laughs> Philip is in the front here. So it's lots of fun. We like to go to Drakensberg. We go to, like to go to uh, Witzishoek uh, in the Drakensberg, ideal place to fly. Um, and like, so typically what we do is we'd go for like a whole weekend. So you're there on the mountain, the whole weekend flying. And, like at some point, you want to listen to some music, right? So you know, what are your options? You can take your phone, you know, plug it into it, yeah, and maybe it's not playing the right song. And that kind of sets me up for, for, for the next video. So sometimes you want to fly like really, really relaxed, right? Like you're like chilling, right? And you want to like get into it. I, I like Top Gun a lot, okay? <laughs> for obvious reasons. And sometimes you want to fly it really fast. Okay, so now what, you know, what are your options here? So what you can do is you can obviously you know, try to switch the song while you're trying to fly, but remember you've got like the, the remote here in your hands and like you can't really fly, like do that. So that was my idea to say, well, can't I build something that will, based on how I'm flying or how I want to fly, play the right song, right? So this is, this is what I'm talking to you guys about today. So those are the three topics. This first one, something called Circuit Python. Some of you might have heard of MicroPython. Who's heard of MicroPython? A lot of people, fantastic. And Circuit Python, like a smaller set of people. There's a good reason for that. Circuit Python is a fork of MicroPython. Uh, the main motivation for Circuit Python is that MicroPython uh, sort of diverged a little bit from the Python spec, where Circuit Python, like, like at the moment, it, it, it adheres to 3.4. Um, that was the main motivation for that. And then I'm going to talk about automatic music categorization. And that the main, motiv main motivation there is because I'm lazy, so I want to get these categories automatically. And then the last bit, which is like the most fun bit for me, was the reinforcement learning music recommendations. Okay, so then firstly, circuit Python, but I kind of have to paint the picture a bit. So you saw my remote control, you saw my plane. Uh, and this is all I've got when I'm on the mountain, so it's like no big compute uh, capability. So what I can do is I can add these little embedded boards, oops, uh, embedded boards on the plane. 
So this is something called the Itsy Bitsy. So Adafruit makes this board, uh, and it runs CircuitPython on it. Um, and I can easily connect a little uh, barometer to it, and it will give me the altitude. And I can get that altitude you know, over time. And this particular radio has a, a telemetry system in it, so I can transmit the telemetry down from the plane you know, to my radio. Right? And then on the radio itself, um, you know, I've got another It's a Bitsy board. This one's just a little, little bit more powerful. Um, I've, I've got an SD card holder, so I can put my songs in there. And I've got a microphone, a headphone jack, and I can put my headphones in there and I can listen to music. Right? So that's just basically the setup. And then both of those boards um, run something called CircuitPython, which I've mentioned before. Um, and then when I showed this, on Tuesday, I showed this talk to some friends of mine. And somebody noticed that, well, firstly, why is the, why is the Python purple? Does anybody know? So Adafruit, is, this, Adafruit was founded by this person called Lady Ada, and her hair is like this pink purple color. And like, and all the products are kind of that color. And then the other thing to notice is that those little uh, stripes on the Python itself are circuit board legs. So it's like a really cool, cool uh, thing. Anyway, um, okay, and circuit Python is awesome. So I've got it plugged in here. Um, so typically, the moment you connect it to your, to your laptop, you can sort of plug it into the board. You connect it to the laptop. It's got this really cool ecosystem that, that happens. Uh, so the first thing that happens is that it mounts itself as a USB drive. And then whatever code I write in Python, uh, you know, I save it there, then it will automatically execute that. So at the moment, uh, the code that I've got right, running there is if I turn the switch, I've got this multi-colored little light that comes on. And I'll show you now like, all the bits and pieces to make that work. This is sort of give you an idea of, of how this thing works. Uh, the other thing that you can do is um, you can sort of uh, create a serial connection onto the board. So this REPL that you're seeing here is on the, on, it's, it's like literally running on this board, right? So now I've got a REPL that I can connect to. Um, I can do you know, code completion. So I can do like import math, something like that. It will do. See, it's got code completion happening there. Let me give me the square root of pi. I'm sure everybody knows that. Um, and uh, the other thing is somebody developed a kernel for CircuitPython. So the kernel runs on your laptop, but it connects via the serial connection to the board. Okay, so what that means is you now in Jupyter Notebook, you can use this kernel, and you can connect to you know, the little board, and you can execute commands. So I made this little video last night. So the first thing you can do, you can sort of import. It will give you the name of the board. Uh, then this is something called Digital I.O., which is, as the name suggests, allowing you to do Digital I.O. So there I'm turning on the LED and turning it off. And then Philip said I must run this six times so you guys can like, really see that it's happening. So there's the LED. It's like it really, it really is happening. Uh, so that's the, I mean, I guess you guys get, it gives you another idea. Then the other thing we want to be able to do is uh, get inputs. So like I showed you, I had this button on here. So if I turn the button on and off, you're going to see like a giant thumb in a very second. I'm sorry for my nails, not very clean. Um, and yeah, so if I, if I run it again, I can read that the button was actually pushed or like the switch was flipped. Uh, and then like a cool little demo is like all of these boards come with these little multicolor LEDs. Which they do, which they use to provide some feedback about the state of the board. You know, is it connected? Is it not? Is there a failure on the code? A nice way to see. But you can also just run it in a little loop, and you get like a multicolored thing. So that that's in a nutshell is uh, circuit Python. Um, oh, last thing. So remember, I wanted to read the altitude. So it's super simple in circuit Python. So I can import. So Adafruit publishes all these libraries to do that. Uh, and this one is called the BMP280, which is the name of that particular sensor. So it uses air pressure to you know, get the altitude. And you can set the sea level pressure. And then if you print it, you know, you'll get the altitude. And now I've got the ability to read it and obviously transmit that down to the recommender. OK, cool. So that's all about CircuitPython. I could probably have done like, an entire talk about it. It's like, really awesome. 
But I want to kind of move on to like the next bit, which is the automatic music categorization. Um, all right, so, so this is the idea, right? We've got the uh, telemetry data coming in, right? Um, and then what I, wanted to, what I thought the easiest way to do this is take like all my songs and kind of put them into these folders on that SD card. You know, so the SD card is there. And then all the, the program really, or the agent really needs to do is then select which folder to, you know, to play a song from. And the, then the idea becomes uh, use the telemetry data have this function that says, for this telemetry data, this is the best folder to pick a song from, all right? Um, and the idea is then to learn F, right? So learn this function, and we're gonna do that using re reinforcement learning, right? And all of this is gonna run, you know, uh, on this microprocessor, at, at the, uh, yeah, microcontroller at the back of the, okay? And then, like I said, I, I really like Top Gun, so I, like, as a first experiment, I took my Top Gun soundtrack, and I kind of uh, said, okay, how do I, how do, I do that? Okay, my, my first thought is, well, I mean, let's listen to some songs, put them into folders. And I thought, well, this sounds like a pain, because like, imagine I'm going to take my entire music library. I'm not going to listen to all of that. I'm way too lazy. This is a weekend project. And I'm not getting paid to label, label data. Right, so then I found this paper, which, is, which I thought was a pretty cool idea. Um, music genre classification using machine learning techniques. And they compared a number of techniques to do that. So there's more traditional feature engineering that goes into it. Uh, and then there's also some ideas around uh, convolutional neural networks. And so this sounds like really cool. So I thought, like, um, you know, this is what I definitely, you know, definitely want to try that out. And um, one of the things that they, they use to feed into the convolutional neural networks are these things called MEL spectrograms. And I'll show you now what a MEL spectrogram looks like. Uh, but I, like, I wanted to know how do I actually generate one, and I found this awesome package, Python package called LibRosa. Um, and it's got lots and lots of utilities. It, it can do classical uh, feature extraction from songs, uh, like tempo detection, uh, but it can also do these MEL spectrograms. Um, and uh, so this is what MEL spectrograms look like. Okay, so that, that's danger zone. So you see, you can see like the little lines there, um, and like it's quite a trippy little visualization of a song, um, but you can kind of figure out what, in a, if I play the next song, just to, just to compare, so just remember what this one looks like, but just to compare. All right, so a lot smoother, you see those little lines, the flowy lines there. So if we, as humans, can kind of see the difference between the songs, then, you know, like a machine can also do that. But I was like really interested in this idea. So what is a MEL spectrogram actually? Like, you know, what, what, what is it actually? So what I thought is like a really cool experiment. Let me take this, like the simplest possible version of this. And I took like a, like a sample of, okay, it can't get simpler than that. So that, that's like A on the first scale on the piano, right? So it's 440 hertz, right? And if I, if I visualize that in a time domain, it's like a single, single frequency. Okay, so what does the MEL spectrogram look like? So the MEL spectrogram for this looks like this. So this should give you a good idea of what's going on. So we've got time here on the x-axis, and the y-axis you've got frequency, but the, the main difference, the main thing to notice here is that the frequency uh, scale is not linear, so it's a non-linear scale. And it's meant to kind of match like the way that we as humans hear music, or hear sounds. Um, so that's, that's what a mouse spectrogram then is. Okay, let's go on. Right, and then in the paper, they use this thing called uh, VGZ16, uh, which is a specific uh, convolutional neural network. Um, who doesn't know what the convolutional neural network is? Who, who does know? You don't know. <laughs> okay, so I need to explain this. So I was showing this to friends of mine on Tuesday at Housework, and uh, some people afterwards said, like, what is this convolutional neural network? So I thought, I assumed kind of everybody knows this. Okay, so this was inspired by the way that the, you know, the visual cortex works. And apparently a lot of cats had to die to, for people to, to know this. It's like kind of sad. Uh, I don't know if that's the reason why there's so many cats on the internet, but anyway, it's like, so this is, let's, let's go with it. Uh, and the way that the visual cortex works is you've got these little, like, so the way that uh, the VGG works, or all these convolutional neural networks, it's got these little filters, or like think of it a kernel, but the kernel is trainable. So if you showed lots of examples, those kernels then you know, starts learning a particular pattern. So an example of a kernel could be like a, like a diagonal stripe or a horizontal stripe. 
And where the convolution part comes in, it, it sort of moves, it slides across the entire image uh, and then collects data about the, the image at each layer. And then while it's going down in a sort of uh, like a funnel, uh, at each layer there's like a, some aggregation and, and activations that happen. Andrew, is that, am I kind of getting it right? Okay. <laughs> Speak to Andrew if you, if you didn't get it, okay. So, so that's the v, so VGG16, it's a very specific one and why it's so popular uh, is like the parameters for it, like the, the full train parameters for ImageNet was released quite early on uh, and a lot of people started using it uh, for that reason. And then the other thing to note is like you see this sort of funnel coming down, as like right at the end um, you get the, the sort of very flat portions of it. Um, and that would be the fully connected layer. So what it actually is, is like the, this is a classifier. So like any classifier you can put on there. So the first bit does the, like the feature extraction. And then after that, there's a classifier that runs. And for VGC16 specifically, there's a thousand classes of uh, images that it will re return. Okay? So like the logical thing here would be to say, fine, I need to classify my songs into these folders, right? So what I need to do is I need to get some sample data, get some labels for this. I need to remove the head here. I need to put a, like a clean head on. I need to do some transfer learning. But like this sounds like a lot of work. So I thought, let me just try this out of the box. Like, I mean, let, let me just feed some images through this thing and see, see what it says. Okay. So this is uh, using Keras. Uh, so Keras is uh, like a very cool um, abstraction layer on top of TensorFlow and other uh, deep learning uh, frameworks. Um, and uh, in Keras is like, I think the main point here is like a couple of lines of code. I mean, like it didn't take me long. Um, the, at the end, you can see what I do is uh, I take, you know, I load the, you know, the spectrogram for uh, danger zone. I run the get predictions. So what I do is I take those uh, spectrograms and I make it a black and white image, right? So I feed it into the into Keras, and it gives me the, these predictions. So it says, well, it thinks it might be a window shade, or a lamp shade. So like, not a cat or a dog, but okay, fine. Um, so not particularly insightful, but I thought, okay, like let me go over this, right? Like let's just see where this goes. So I said, okay, okay, cool, cool, all right. So then I said, like let me take those those output vectors, all right? So these are a thousand long. Right, and then like I'm just going to put it into to my favorite clustering algorithm, hierarchical clustering. Uh, so how hierarchical clustering works, it sort of takes pairs, you know, the, the songs that are most similar, and that would be the, the layer furthest to the right, and sort of group them, and then it would take groups of twos, and then you know find the closest ones and slowly build it up. And what I really liked about this is this is, looks exactly like a folder structure, right? So like now I'm like I'm feeling much closer to my goal. And so I literally just took the songs as they were, I ran them through the data clustering, Euclidean with a ward linkage. Um, and you can see all the green songs here are actually like, well, if you know the Top Gun soundtrack, they're, they're quite similar. So that'd be like Danger Zone, Great Walls of Fire, Playing with the Boys, Hot Summer Nights. So all of these songs, high rhythm songs, like in all the slower songs, uh, you know, like Sitting on the Dock of the Bay, uh, Take My Breath Away, all the song, slower songs getting put together, right? When I show this uh, you know, to some friends and they said, well, hang on, you know, what about the curse of dimensionality, right? You've got like a thousand vector deep here, you're clustering these things together, and uh, like it's, like, but it still kind of works, right? So, I mean, I, I did a lot of experimentation with it, but like if you, if you can imagine what's happening here, like actually only a small portion of classes actually gets activated. And like it's typically the lampshade and the, you know, the rug and, and so on. So, so the curse of dimensionality, not so much, but I did a lot of bunch of other experiments, um, you know, doing PCAs and you know, all of it, but actually, like right out of the box, just like this, seems to work the best. So, like, okay, so, so, okay, okay, so it works. So now, so now I'm able to take my songs, I put them into these folders, I load them in the SD card, and I'm good to go. And that's that's then the okay, that was just the code for that. That's the end of my automatic uh, music categorization session. So I've got the songs now in those folders. Now we're getting to the reinforcement learning uh, bit of it, uh, which was actually lots of fun to do. Um, yeah, so kind of just to reiterate, so what we wanted to say, uh, we've got those, uh, the altitude coming in, we want to learn this function f, we're going to feed it a bunch of features, and then uh, it will choose a particular song to play from. Uh, and then the question is, okay, so, so what are the features that I can derive? Now since I've only got like a single time series, not, there's not a hell of a lot I can do. Um, 
The other thing is I needed to, to collect some data, and um, like coding on the mountain is not that much fun. Like, so you know, getting your laptop there, and then you're flying along. Uh, but I, then I found this uh, simulator called CROC Sim, Sim uh, and it's an open source simulator specifically for slope gliding. So fantastic, it's open source, so you know, I modified it a little bit for, to spit out the telemetry as a JSON string you know, onto standard error, and then I pipe the standard error into my Python code, and now I can do you know, sort of real-time feature engineering on top of that. And then what I did is just for today is like, I, took, I made the screen video. So the screen video, you're going to see next, is now the simulator flying. And then I've overlaid uh, you know, the telemetry as it comes in, and I explained the features that I, that I kind of derived from that. OK, so that's the simulator flying. So there's my altitude uh, coming in from the simulator. So the, the obvious thing is just to take the first derivative or the rate of change of altitude. So you can see, it's like as I'm diving up and down, I'm going to get that. And the sec then the features that I derive from that is, is like a histogram or percentage of time it spends at, at particular altitudes, or percentage of time that I spend um, at a certain rate of climb. And then just because I've, I'm working with these like tiny little uh, processes, and I can't really keep history or moving averages, like I use exponential smoothing, and it like seems to work really well. So it's got a bit of a history; it, it kind of forgets stuff, and it uh, like also like the, the more recent stuff is more important. Um, okay, so those are kind of the features that I that I had to work with, right? Okay, so all right, so I've got the features there, uh, some function of altitude and and the rate of change of altitude. Then the other thing I decided was I want to use a naive base on this, again, because it's super simple, it's fast, it will run, it doesn't require a lot of history, a lot of memory. And remember, I want to train it while I'm flying, or like on the fly, right? So, it's okay. <laughs> okay. I was told to include that one, okay. So, <laughs> all right. So, basically what I want to do is I want to get the probability that this is the, the best folder given the features, and uh, you guys, I'm sure, know all uh, the, the base uh, formula there. Um, and there's like actually like not a lot of information that you have to uh, kind of capture to um, you know to compute this on you know and to train uh, as you go. Um, then the other thing I wanted to do is um, remember I still don't have a target variable, right? And I'm not going to label these things like I'm gonna, like I'm set on that. So the only way I'm going to get a target variable is to do interactions with me as the pilot. So I'm going to play a song, and if I don't like it, uh, I'm going to skip. And if I do like it. I'm going to keep on listening, right? And I kind of decided 40 seconds is my, like, that was just my personal thing. Like, after 40 seconds, if I'm still listening, the song probably matches what I'm doing. I think something, like, interesting that I noted here is that there's actually, like, two feedback loops happening here. The first feedback loop is me, like, you know, telling this re reinforcement learning agent, you know, what I like and what I don't like. But also, it's suggesting songs to me, and, like, that affects the way that I'm flying, right? So if I don't hear that danger zone song, like, I'm going to fly, right? Like, it's going to happen. Like, it's like, so if it suggests that, it's going to be right. So, so it's not, like, not a, so that's, a, yeah, okay, so that, that's kind of, okay. So, right, so how am I going to do this? Um, so there's this thing called the multi-arm bandit, right? So this is a re classic reinforcement learning problem, and, uh, like, thought experiment. So you're standing in the casino, you've got all these one-arm bandit machines in front of you, some of them have got a better payout than some of the other machines, right? And you have to choose, you have to kind of figure out how to get the maximum payout, all right? So you can sort of translate this into this. Songs, I have to choose which folder, like which is the right folder to choose. Okay, you get it. Um, and uh, with the multi arm banner, there's kind of two concepts. The one's something is called explore. So initially what I'm going to do, I'm in front of these machines, I'm just going to like randomly pull some of them, right? And then I'm going to, at some point, I'm going to find one of those machines that consistently pay out. And then I'm going to start exploiting that. So that's the that second phase of it. So there's explore, exploit. And this whole field of study is like, how do I balance exploring with exploiting? Because if I explore too much, you know, I'm kind of leaving money on the table. But if I start exploiting too early, then you know, I might not find the, the optimal machine there. Right? I might have a, like a wrong perception of what the world looks like. Okay, so that's the multi-arm bandit. And, and like, roughly how it works, like I said, you've got, you start with pure explore. So initially, when you know, I turn the thing on and I fly and it, it doesn't have any memory, then what, what I would do, it would just purely choose random songs and it would feed me the songs. And then I would either skip or listen to the song. Right? And, and then as it starts learning, what it will do, it will start exploiting a little bit more and exploiting less. Um, and then finally, you know, 
uh, I think it's quite a nice uh, life motto as well, like never stop exploring. So it must always explore. It must never think it knows exactly what I like. It must always explore because my taste will change over time. Uh, you know, flying conditions will change. Different songs, you know, you know whatever. So that's, that's the multi arm bandit problem. Uh, and like the hello world of multi arm bandit, this is five minutes, okay? Hello world of multi arm bandit is something called Epsilon Greedy. And uh, let's see what it says. Like, Epsilon percent of the time, I'm going to explore, and the rest of the time I'm going to exploit. Like, super simple. And I can make Epsilon sort of degrade over time or adapt to different conditions. You know, I can do lots of things uh, to it. Um, some of the other strategies is something called upper confidence bound. So what I say is like in the face of uncertainty, I'm going to assume some distribution, I'm going to take an upper confidence bound on the distribution, and I'm going to pretend that's the new probability, which means songs that I haven't, uh, sort of folders that I haven't listened to for a while, haven't to listened to a lot, will somehow get upweighted because you know, it doesn't know whether I'm actually going to like it or not, because there's a different way to. And then Thompson something is a Bayesian technique, which I'm not going to go into now, given the, the time. Okay. So how, did the, how does the training work? So I've got those features. I've got the um, naive Bayes. Uh, so one thing I did is okay, so I binarized my features. So this actually turns into something which I later learned was something called Bernoulli naive Bayes. And it just makes the computation like, so much easier you know, on, these, on this device. I need to count how many times a particular folder was up there. So that will give me the P of folder. right? And I need to count. Uh, how many times the, a particular feature is associated with a particular folder, which will give me the probability of the feature conditional on folder. Right? So, the, so, so the point here is actually, uh, there's actually only a few number of variables that I need to keep track of to be able to train you know, while, I'm, while I'm flying. Right? Okay, so this is my experiment. So the experiment said, okay, I'm going to record some of the uh, telemetry from my simulator. Uh, and I decided like folder zero is like everything before 40 seconds, and then folder one is everything after 40 seconds. Okay, and, but now you might think, hang on, hang on, where's the 40 seconds now? Because these songs are typically like two or three minutes long. Okay, but this is an experiment, right? So I kind of like accelerated things a bit. Um, but how it translates to is within like the first 40 seconds, it would have been equivalent to listening to about eight songs, five, five to eight songs. And in the next 40 seconds, also like five to eight songs. Just give you a sense, like how many songs effectively the, the, it, it listened to. Um, all right, so this is the first result. So from scratch, it means that it had no memory. So initially, it just says 50 50, like it's either folder zero or folder one, 50 50. And then after a while, because I'm, you know, it's recommending and I'm listening and recommending and listening, it's starting to think, okay, hang on, that might be actually folder zero for the first 40 seconds. Uh, but you see, like, uh, that line that jumps down is obviously every time it's still exploring. Initially, it's exploring quite wildly. And then after a while, so after 40 seconds, what you'll see now uh, is obviously the slower songs, which is folder one. Uh, and, and now it's exploring less, and, and you know, it's kind of finding that. So then I took that strained model. So it was like maybe 16 songs in total that I fed through it. Uh, and then I applied it again to the simulator. So you're going to see the simulator now again in action. So that's my altitude. It was ex the exact same sequence, the altitude and the uh, rate of change. And then this is the target variable, which is purely just like depicting over time what, the, you know, what my truth, my experimental value is. And then the classify output here. So while I'm flying here, so I'm not training it. So it's purely just using the inputs from the uh, you know, telemetry to decide which folder. So it's doing actually pretty well. Um, you'll see now around 40 seconds, the top line at the rough the experiment target is going to drop down to uh, about zero. But the classifier doesn't uh, know that yet, because remember, I've got this exponential smoothing like a time constant in there. So it's still thinking, you know, like this guy uh, wants to listen to fast songs, but then after a while, it, it kind of uh, realizes that. And then as I was flying around like slowly, I also kind of got bored and I decided to, to at some point do a bit of a dive. Uh, I think, yeah, you're going to see that now. Uh, about now. So they are going a bit of a dive. Um, and that dive like, uh, confused the, the output a bit, the classifier a bit. But maybe it was also fine, because maybe I was kind of in the mood to now go into danger zone again. Right? So, so, so fine. So, so I was quite, quite happy with these, these results. Um, and I said, let me do some like, proper data science here. Um, so I said, like, create a whole, complete holdout set. So the first 20 seconds, the classifier was trained on, and the next 20 seconds, it wasn't trained on, but just evaluated on. 
and then again on trained on 22nd and then evaluated on. And it's still able to track. Um, so the blue line that you're seeing there is the output now of the, like, let's call it evaluation set or holdout set. And like I was quite happy, it's not overfitting. Okay, so that's fine. All right, I'm near, nearing to the end of it. Okay, so this is now the final, like the final project product. So it's like package. It's I kind of 3D printed this little case. I got some press sticks to hold it at the back of my transfer there. Okay, and then on the plane, the other borders. So the other borders there. There's a telemetry between the two. Uh, so, it's, so this is quite practical. Um, we went to uh, Wackerström over the last long weekend. Tested it, like it works really well. Like, I mean, I think a big part of it is also just how you package it and like is it practical to use and, and so on. So, so that, that was great. Um, okay, so that, those were the three topics I spoke about. So circuit Python, the categorization, reinforcement learning, uh, and then I've got some takeaways for you. Oh, future work. So this was I was asked to do. So none of you probably fly, right? So how can you use, and, and why is this important to you, and why should you care, right? So imagine you can be in your car, and the way that you drive, right, can influence the songs that you listen, like you're playing, right? And imagine you can create this super positive feedback loop, right? You can go faster and faster, right? <laughs> Very awesome, right? Okay? So I also want to do some better, uh, I think there's still a lot to be explored in that. I, I, I literally just took the guy's paper and, and ran it through, and I really want to do more flying and test this thing, so that's definitely on my agenda. Okay, and then some takeaways. Um, so because of all of the size of the videos, I really wanted to upload it before doing this talk, but it will be available, uh, Fly Sky DJ. I don't know, unless, unless someone's got a better name, but I thought Fly Sky DJ could be a nice name for the project. Uh, check out circuitpython.org, lots of resources. If you want to buy one of these boards or some of these boards, uh, they're available quite readily. Uh, lots of uh, electronic stores uh, in Gauteng, at least, or in Cape, like actually in the country. Librosa, you've got, uh, and then a really cool Python package, which I didn't use for this project, uh, called Bandits, but it implements some of those uh, like other algorithms as well. And I think I might be slightly over time, but is there any questions? Awesome. Uh, thank you very much. Cool. Uh, questions? I see one at the back. Cool. Um, so you've got uh, an action space of about 16 songs, right? So that's your action, action space, right? Uh, your state... Well, well for, for this example, right? For, so yeah, I mean, well, my action space would normally be a little bit big, but fine, go for it. Um, your state space uh, also not being quite large, so technically, you know, convergence probably ha happens quite a lot faster. Um, but, I mean, how long did this take to actually, like, reinforce it the whole time? How, how long did you actually spend, you know, reinforcing this, skipping the song or not? Yeah, so that was the, like, the experiment I ran was the first time I actually did it. Um, and like, like I said, it took about between five and eight songs for it to learn one class, and then five to eight songs to learn another class. Okay. But like, I, like, I'm not convinced because like, I promise you next time I go, like, remember there's lots of variables that I don't control in this. Is like, like when you're on the site and the conditions are great, yes, you can do those like fantastic uh, maneuvers and like you spin and you go nuts. But you can, might, another day you might go and like the wind's is kind of marginal uh, and then you can't get that same telemetry. So I think like for me, it was more important for this thing to be able to adapt quite quickly. So even in that naive base classifier, what I do is I kind of limit like how much evidence it thinks it has. So when it calculates, uh, you know, the confidence balance and things like it kind of, I kind of force it to forget to rather adapt to, to the day. Uh, so it's like, uh, I'm not sure if that answers your... Yeah? Cool. Anyone else? Uh, anyone else? Hello, Skok. That was such a cool talk. Thanks, man. Can you turn it on and see the telemetry? Uh, or is it... I don't know if it's possible to show. Oh, um, you know, I can do it like in the open space if you want. Okay, maybe maybe after. Yeah, well, I can do it in the open space. So what I can do is I, mean, I connect the USB to here, and we turn this on. You'll see the telemetry coming through. Did you look at any other um, embedded boards, or was did you go straight for the Itsy Bitsy because of the good Python support? Yeah, you know, so so the telemetry board I initially just used an Arduino board, like a cheap uh, Arduino on there. Um, 
Then I found the, the Python rules. So initially, it was, it was going to be a, a Raspberry Pi, like on the plane. And then I saw this thing called, like, it's a bit and it's got Python on it. And I thought, like, this might be the answer, because you don't have to have this. Because the Raspberry Pi also kind of boots up first and so on, whereas this is, like, immediately when you turn it on, and, like, you, you know, it's, it's in runtime. So, and then once I did that, I also converted the board on the plane also to run CircuitPython because now I've got like... And then the other really cool thing about CircuitPython, like all of the, that whole recommender code, the naive base, all of that, I could actually... I, I just like developed it on my machine, right? Like on my laptop. I got it to work with the simulator. Uh, at some point, I actually put the simulator like as a hardware in the loop, right? Oh, sorry, the, the remote is hardware in the loop. So I would take the simulator output and physically feed it into the, the microcontroller get the recommendations, and then get Pygame to play the song for me, right? So, so I could be able to test this whole thing, sometimes code running on my PC, sometimes the code running on the... And so there's like a brilliant ecosystem. Cool. All right. No more questions? Cool. Anyone else? No. Thank you oh, very much. There oh, might, be, might be another one. Uh, thanks, Kolk. Yeah, this was Really cool. <laughs> cool, yeah. um, Lots of fun. So, so something it looks like you, you did is you, you, know, you mentioned that you work as a data scientist in your day job. And so you, you were applying quite a, some pretty sophisticated machine learning techniques to this. How did it feel like mixing that with like your hobby? Like did, you, did you feel at times it felt like you were actually doing work or did you find that they came together naturally? Uh, no, so, like, so I think we spoke about it last night as well, but like, like Late 90s, like I got introduced to this idea of data and that data can do things. And at that stage, I was doing this as my hobby, like after hours. And like I never stopped doing that. Uh, like use data, do cool machine learning stuff, um, the embedded boards, uh, the flying. I think it, all of those sort of came together for me uh, in, this, in this project. Uh, and lo lots of fun to do. All right. Cool. Thank you very much. Uh, can we have another round of applause? Thanks. Thanks.